south in the Atlantic west of Shetland. A party of climbers have come north to try to find a way up the cane. It's lost in the mist, but there's 1,300 feet of it, and it's said to be the highest sea cliff in Britain. Pete Willems is the party's most experienced climber. Strangely, the idea of the climb came from the youngest and least experienced member of the team, Abigail Mann. Yeah. Yeah. Is that 700 foot we can see there? That's, yeah. that's going to be... 700 foot, and this is only half the height of the cane. Yeah. Well, I had this phone call from Abigail Mann. The first thing she said was, uh, I'm Abigail Mann. I'm organising a trip to Fula, and she said, um, you won't believe this, but I'm only 17, and I didn't. <laughs> 17, indeed. And she told me that she'd phoned quite a few other people, well-known climbers, and they had expressed an interest. Well, I didn't know what to think to start with. I, I said, yes, certainly, I'll be, uh, I'll be interested if you can get it together, and said, get in touch with me when uh, you know a little bit more about it. I got to know about Fula through Dad's stories from when he was here about 30 years ago. And he told me all about the cave. So I looked on the map and decided that might be a good idea. Fula is almost as far as one can go and still be in the British Isles. It's said to be the Ultima Thule of the Romans, the most remote spot imaginable. Just three miles by two, it's the most lonely inhabited island in Britain. Its population of between 30 and 40 are crocters. They're a very self-sufficient breed. Life here is dominated by the weather. A morning in sunshine can be swamped by thick mist in 20 minutes. The rolling surface of the island is tilted quite steeply up to the west to end at the cliffs. Given the size and scale of these cliffs, I'm quite amazed that climbers have not been here before. As far as we can determine, and it's really just speculation and rumor, there's only been a few parties over here ever seems to be some rumour that um, a group of commandos were here. Well, I don't know whether it was commandos. It was Royal Navy. Um, I rather would hope that commandos would have made a better job of it than this lot did, but they sent a team um, in in rubber boats to the foot of the cane, but they hadn't looked at the weather first, and there was a very, very bad swell, and they found it very difficult to land the boys. They did land them eventually, and um, they got up up two or three hundred feet but they had very great difficulty in getting them off again and they had to abandon everything and, and um, bring them off. But two days later, two young Fula men went with a rowing boat and one of them scaled up where the ropes had been left, beautiful naval climbing rope, and went up in his stocking feet and brought it down again and um, we still have that rope um, in Fula. Right from the onset, I thought it was very important for tackling a cliff of this nature that you had a team of climbers who were not only experts at climbing sea cliffs, but also knew each other well. I was very pleased to hear that Murray Hamilton, who I've known for many years now and is one of the leading climbers in Scotland, would be along on this trip. And as well as that, Ian McMullen, who I personally have climbed with over the last four or five years, agreed to come as well. So the three of us together, I thought, made a very strong unit. And we set off in the first instance to explore the cliff, to upsail down and see if we could find a good natural line. We decided from the onset that we were going to have to fix ropes all the way down the cane from the summit to its base. This was necessary, first of all, so that we could establish a feasible route that we could all get up. Also, to find out just how good or bad the rock was, to clear any loose materials. And besides all this, 
we were going to have to have fixed ropes in position for the camera team to get down there. Certainly overhanging at the top anyway. Of course we brought with us an inflatable boat and outboard and ideally we'd like to tackle this cliff from the bottom. But so far we've had incessant swell, quite a lot of rain and the slabs at the bottom are very greasy. And I had the original idea of coming to Fula. I hadn't even seen a photograph of the cave. And it was only when Pete had fell down that I got any idea of the sheer scale of it. The cane itself is of the order of 1,300 feet above sea level. But in actual terms, our feet of climbing is far more than that, something like 1,800 feet, which is as long as anything in Britain, for certain, has been climbed before. Hello, Pete, this is Abby. Can you hear me? Yes, Abigail, I can hear you. How's the climb looking? Well, the rock here is very good, actually. It's good quality sandstone, very solid. It's pretty mucky, though. There's quite a lot of lichen on the rock. It's certainly quite steep. The top 300 foot here that we've come down is, is very steep. It's quite impressive. I think you're going to enjoy this. And how many of you are down there? Ian and I are at a belay on the rib here, about 330 foot down from the top. We're now fixing as many anchor points as we can. Murray's about 100 feet above our head here. Uh, he should be coming down to join us in a minute. Over. Our biggest worry, right from the onset, was just how loose this rock was going to be. So when I abseiled over for the first time, I was really pleasantly surprised to find that the top section, at least, was composed of huge sandstone blocks, and they were all bedded in and well-jointed. The quality of the rock was um, amazingly good. Oh, gee, that's loose. This was September, later in the summer than the climbers would have wished. But there was a good reason for that, the birds. There's always been a problem between recreation and conservation in this country at any level. Birds and climbers is one that's particularly been a problem for quite some years. I think today it's becoming a lot more resolved. It's been specially planned so that we would be here outside the breeding period of most of the important seabirds. We found that nearly all the orcs, the guillemots, the razorbills, and most of the puffins have now left the sea cliffs. And the only bird that is really left in any numbers are former petrels. On an expedition like this, one can't expect everyone to spend all their time on the rather tedious business of cleaning and fixing ropes on the cane. We needed a little excitement. The Garda stack, which lay just off the shore from where we were stopping, is one of the most prominent features on Fula, and it also happens to be some of the very best rock available for climbing. We thought if we could fix a permanent rope across to this, it would be ideal for training purposes. So the day before, we went across, swam, on a nice calm day, managed to fix this long rope from the shore to the stack. The next day, 
we had to try it out. Unfortunately, we picked a day when the sea was very strong, really big swell coming in. We felt it was very important as climbers to maintain our fitness while we were on the island. Abseiling down the cliffs and cleaning is fine, but it doesn't keep you physically fit for climbing itself. And given that we were having quite a lot of bad weather as well, the garter stack here provided an excellent opportunity to keep ourselves fit, climbing fit. Close by, Abigail was going through her paces. You're slanting towards me. At the start of it all, it never occurred to me how much organisation it was going to take. There was the whole expedition, from finding climbers, food, travel, equipment, and getting to know the island. Then there was the film. With all this, my climbing almost got forgotten. Given that Abigail had done so much, everyone was keen that she should eventually have a go at climbing the came if at all possible. Right. But the fact was that she wasn't it. that experienced. That's it, fine. Just push with your left leg, straighten it up. Right. That's it. And I know the difference between you could fit both arms around the rest and I couldn't. It's a question of uh, getting a little more supple, I think. Can do it on the cave. That's it. Keep standing in balance. Save the energy. That's it. Just keep working your way up. It's always best if climbers make their own judgments about their abilities and Abigail knew that she wasn't climbing well. Sometimes when the mist and weather above six or seven hundred feet were too thick for work up on the came, the climbers would explore some of the lower cliff faces. John Holborn was the expert. So what are our chances of getting the top here? Well, it's been a very damp, wet month, as you've probably seen in the short time you've been here so far. The cloud seems to stay on the hill most of the time if it's that sort of weather. You know, you'll get an afternoon and a morning when it's clear, but chances of a full day are not so good. I mean, last, last month, last four weeks, we've only had two days where the top's been clear the whole day. It's pretty miserable and damp and wet. Personally, you know, I think we just have to wait for a couple of days. The forecast's bad, I know, but we're just going to have to sit and wait till we get an opportunity to get down it and look at it. Okay. Do you think that it will be possible to land the boat at the bottom of the I don't reckon so. Depends on the state well, as well. well. We've seen and I'm very good, I That's 20 foot of vertical seaweed in there. Mm. Well. The problem of Pula is that when the weather is as bad as this, there's very little we can do except sit around in our bunks and talk about climbing. Time is getting short, and if the weather doesn't improve soon, then our chances are going to be very slim indeed. 
When the weather did improve, the party often split up. One group to work on the came, another with the camera crew here, was back to those spectacular and very difficult rock slabs. The temptation to have a go at them was altogether too much for Johnny Dawes and Dave Thomas. The came itself wouldn't be easy, but for the time being it could wait. Near that loose flake. Yeah. I got across and, and got to this flake. This flake's only joined on in two places. In order to use it, you have to push it into the ledge that it's sitting on. And so you have to use this, this small pocket foothold. <laughs> What's it look like? Pretty bold. <laughs> Way gripping, hey? What a gripper. That middle pitch is more more about what the whole the whole route is, really. I mean it's just, just taking the easiest line up quite a big wall in a tremendous position. Um, no, it, it, it just seems to run on for ages. You just get really engrossed in the climbing because it, it, it's really intricate. I mean, you can really play about with it. Thing is so cold. They're hanging around. The leader is attached by a rope, but the point at which the rope is fixed to the cliff is always below him, sometimes 30 or 40 feet below, so that if he does fall, he's going to drop some considerable distance. Here he's putting in another running belay, an attachment point before going on. on that little pitch, which made it even easier to really enjoy it. And I was quite surprised how long it was as well, the full 150 foot pitch. I couldn't believe it, it's just brilliant, brilliant. On a rather easier part of the cliff, Abigail was trying things out. She'd given so much to get the expedition here in the first place, that it seemed only right that she should get as much help and encouragement as possible. But the important thing was for her to decide for herself about the cane. Go on, Abby, go down. You can do it. Go on, you. Right, go down. The down. problem is with the line that we have looked at on the cane, the climbing will certainly be at RBS, possibly a little harder than that. And if that level is an absolute maximum for Abigail when she's fit, then we've got problems because we're talking about a very long route of that standard, and it's loose in places, and it's dirty in places. Right, all right. I don't... 
It's one thing to climb on a nice, clean, gritstone outcrop on a route that's been done dozens of times before, and it's quite something else to be able to climb that standard on rock which is dubious and dirty. And move round. Oh, hot work! Abigail was beginning to realise for herself that the came was going to be too hard. It's a bit cold with having stood around for quite a while. Yeah, I've got the shakes. Yeah. Because it's once Paul said you shouldn't be going down there, I suddenly thought... Paul said? <laughs> well, he said my ass feeling isn't really up to it. Who did Paul? Yeah. After I those. a real confidence boost, <laughs> isn't it? And I got over the edge and I thought, hold on, I shouldn't be here. <laughs> and you looked an awful long way down. <laughs> That evening there was a small conference. Abigail took the decision very well. Indeed, she herself prompted it. In a way, I think it's, it's ironical, really, because Abigail has spent probably much of the last two months organising this trip, arranging it, getting it off the ground, and perhaps if she spent that same length of time training herself, getting out on the rock, she would probably have been in a situation where she could have done it. Well, as you can probably see, the weather conditions here are not too good. The seas have been running very big for a few days, and we've been having quite a lot of rain, but we're now running out of time. We've had to make the decision that tomorrow, although the weather forecast is not good, it's for showers and quite strong winds, we're going to have to upsail down the face and attempt to climb it from the bottom. The time that came without actually landing at the bottom from the sea was obviously a disappointment. But perhaps from the beginning, it was never really a practical proposition. It was always apparent right from the start that to get climbers and film camera crew down to the bottom of this 1800 foot face and to try and film an ascent in a single day was asking a great deal. It took over three hours to get everyone in the climbing party down to the bottom. If the weather held, they estimated it would take between seven and eight hours for them to get back up. The only ropes which would be left in position would be those for the camera crew. Boys, I'll leave a line of chalk so you you know you know which is the easiest line. All right? Okay. I, I, I'm eternally indebted to you. Pete. I know, I know, but we'll do our best. Northern grit. <laughs> See, the main thing is finding a belay on this one. Isn't it? Ah! Instantly pulled backwards and killed. Can I have some more? We started the climb a short distance above the sea 
away from the greasy slabs which form the very lowest section. And to start with, spirits were very high. The slabs in the lower section are very easy angled. And as well as this, the rock is quite compact. Being sea washed, it's still very solid and firm at this point. So everybody was feeling in quite a jovial mood. Climbing something like the cane involves a great deal. It isn't simply a, just a rock climbing feat. We have a great deal to contend with. There's loose rock, there's vegetation, there's the sheer scale of the place, the raging sea below. It's far more a mountaineering challenge than just a piece of rock gymnastics. The rope's twisted. The man in the yellow helmet isn't part of the climbing team. He's Sid Peru, one of the two cameramen. He's also abseiled down from the top. Just before we reached the top of the little cane, we were hit by heavy showers and the wind was strengthening as well. And with it being such a big face and having already experienced the vagaries of the weather here on Fula, it was quite apparent that if the weather changed suddenly, we could be in a very dangerous situation. The little came is a sizable ledge about a third of the way up. It's one of the reasons that there's a bit of debate among climbers as to whether Fula has the highest cliff in Britain. The other claimant is a cliff called Conacher on the even more remote island of St Kilda. Pete Willens and Ian McMullen had made the first ascent of that only the year before. And they reckon St Kilda, while harder in parts, was nothing like as high as Fooler's came. Is this all right? Do you think this is the easiest route? Jay Dawes in extreme. The sloping ledges at the bottom of the pitch were uh, still covered with move. soil from from cleaning. Nobody had thought to clean off the ledges, and they were still wet from the shower. So. Uh, they were incredibly right. Oh no, they look a right idiot if he falls off, won't he? The, the friction uh, of the rock is dependent on, uh, on whether it's uh, wet or dry, but uh, lichen on the rock makes it, uh, makes it far more slippery in the wet and uh, can be as little as just no friction at all. And the top of this route is just like that. There may be some time up there, you might have to fix a bolt. All climbing has its risks, cliff climbing especially so, but here on Fula they had to be particularly careful because of course on such a remote island, if they did get into trouble or if someone got hurt, they could expect no help from anyone. Great, isn't it? Really hard, isn't it? The hardest part of the climbing on the cane was clearly going to be the upper pitches. We knew already from our cleaning that if this section was wet, it was going to present us with major problems. Fortunately though, as the day went on, the weather improved and the rock started to dry out. The 
I think for the climbers, the route has has a certain amount of danger. Um, I mean, that is compounded by the number of people that, that were on it. Um, uh, the the film group that that was really that's really my concern about the danger element, not actually climbing. Also, when when one's in front of a camera, you do tend to feel obliged to move, even when you might be thinking uh, that it's not the time to move. You would sooner just spend a bit more time getting yourself happy with uh, protection, and uh, you realise that the camera is rolling on you, and you think I should move here. When you go on a, a climb of this nature, you, you always have it in your mind which pictures you would like to leave. And uh, in this instance, because the, these two pictures anyway were, were going to be the best in terms of leading, giving enjoyable climbing, I think we all secretly wanted to lead the the pitch. And uh, when you set off, you sort of work it out. If, if such a body leads the, this pitch, he'll lead the next one, and then, then I'll have this one. And, and as it turned out, I, I was, you know, pleased, but at the same time apprehensive that I'd, uh, I'd got one of the best pitches. Anyway, I was, uh, I was with a big cheesy grin on my smile, and Pete wasn't that happy because I got the pitch. <laughs> but uh, that's the way it goes. Altogether, the climb took nearly 10 hours. Our feelings on reaching the top were a mixture of achievement and relief. Achievement because it had been a hard climb, but relief especially in that the whole team, climbers and film crew, had escaped from this potentially lethal face unscathed. I was disappointed for Abby in that she'd put a hell of a lot of her work in preparation and it is a great deal of effort that you need to put in to make something like this come off. One has to be complimentary to those efforts but at the same time climbing's a, a dangerous and serious game. <laughs> 